Hello everyone, this is the April 24th lecture. Um, we're going to continue our discussion of carbohydrates. Uh, we started this discussion last day and what we're going to look at today is the cyclic form of sugars. Now, sugars are capable of forming intermolecular hemiacetal. So the carbonyl group and one of the alcohols on the system interact with one another. Um, and the most common ring types are going to be five membered and six membered rings. I know, shocking. Um, I've only mentioned this, you know, probably a hundred times during the course of the semester that these rings are easy, most easily formed. Um, hopefully we've learned that by now, right? Um, and uh, in these systems, six-membered rings are referred to as pyranoses, and five-membered rings are re referred to as or called furanoses. And in part, this name is similar to something we've seen in class before, this heterocycle called furan, furanoses. Um, you may or may not be familiar with this. If you are, then this helps. If you're not, it's just a weird correlation. At any rate, if we look at glucose here, um, you can see that you can either form a five or a six membered ring in this system. I've shown the five membered ring closing in a black line here, and um, you can form the following D-glucofuranose. Of course, there's a new stereocenter formed in closing this material because um, you're going to form a stereocenter at where the carbonyl group is in this case. And now the OH group can either be up or down. So we've taken a single molecule and turned it into two new diastereomers. Okay. Um, now this reaction center we'll talk about more in a second, but it turns out that this um, furanose is less stable than the six-membered ring. And you'll see why for glucose in just a moment. Um, if the red, it, um, the hydroxyl group in this position, the D position, closes and forms um, the hemiacetal. This forms a D um, plus glucopyranose. And of course, once again, there's a new stereocenter here. This hydroxyl group can be up or down. In this case, it happens to be up. And if you draw this structure out, you'll find that it is a chair form of cyclohexane and all of the groups are equatorial in this case. So this lends a new um, level of stability to these molecules because of all of the equatorial um, groups in this system. Now, with the OH equatorial in this case, this is referred to as beta. Um, so wait, let's just highlight that a little bit. Um, this is the beta form of the sugar. And if that hydroxyl group is axial, that is referred to as, in this scribble over here, the alpha form of the structure. So these are the two form of pyranoses that glucose forms. And due to the stability of the chair form and having these groups all equatorial, these are fairly stable structures. Now, the mutarotation of glucose, what this basically is, is the conversion between alpha and beta forms of the pyranoses. So if we have a concentrated solution of glucose at room temperature, what happens is we get crystal formation. We are crystallizing glucose out. Um, and this material that we isolate is a melting point of approximately 146 degrees. It turns out that it's all the alpha form. Now, if you take this pure alpha form, it has an, it has a, uh, an optical rotation of a plus 112. Now, if we dissolve it in water and you me and measure the optical rotation immediately, you will find plus 112. But as a fu function of time, it shifts and it'll finally settle at plus 52.7. Now, this means that an equilibrium is established itself in solution. And it is an equilibrium between the alpha and beta form of the um, of the the purinose and it's also the acyclic form so this has been thoroughly investigated and they found that in this case in solution at equilibrium 36.4 percent of the glucose is in the alpha form 63.6 uh, is in the beta form and 0.003% is in the acyclic form. Now, if you add the alpha and beta numbers up, you should come up with 100%. I know this, it's just saying that primarily um, glucose is in the alpha and beta forms in solution, although there is a small amount that is acyclic. There has to be because that is how the conversion is occurring. Now, if you 
going back to last lecture when I went through all the structures, I started talking about how wonderfully weird all of these stereo centers are. This is a incredible problem. And so a lot of the um, chemistry that we're going to talk about here simply points out or simply delves into how we determine the different structures of these molecules. And this is the chemistry and this is the reactions that were used to modify these species to come up with these conclusions. So first of all, we're going to talk about the oxidation of sugars phalanx test. This is a test for reducing sugars. So all aldoses are reducing sugars. Ketoses are not. This reaction is a very weak oxidizing reaction. So things that are easily oxidized, aldehydes will oxidize, but alcohols will not. So in the aldose that's shown down here, um, we use a copper two complex, which is a blue solution, a little bit of hydroxide and water. And what happens is this will oxidize a reducing sugar or an aldose to the carboxylic acid. In this case, this is D-gluconic acid. This was glucose over here, sorry. Um, but the thing that happens or the thing that allows you to know what's going on in this reaction is you get this brick red color solution, which is the generation of this copper two oxide. Um, this is a very visible means of telling that you have a reducing sugar in this system. Another really cool test is the Tollens test. Um, this is a test that is the reaction of ketoses. It oxidizes one of the hydroxyl groups next to the ketone, so you get a di, uh, an alpha dicarbonyl compound. But what you do is you use a silver salt, ammonium hydroxide, and water, and this oxidizes this material, and the silver gets reduced. Now what happens is this silver plates itself out on the inside of the glass of the vessel that you're doing the reaction in. And if you're doing this in a test tube, what happens is it gives you a silver mirror. And so when you're looking at this and you see this reaction occurring, um, you can watch the reaction for a while and you don't see much, but all of a sudden you'll be seeing your face in the test tube because the silver is plated out on the edge and now you're seeing this test tube acting as a mirror and you get to see your beautiful reflection. Okay, um, so these are two reactions just to identify whether a, uh, um, identify whether a uh, carbohydrate whew, um, is a ketose or an aldose. Okay, um, we can also oxidize these materials um, so we can create mono and dicarboxylic acids. So in the case of mannose here, we treat it with bromine and water. Um, bromine can be an oxidizing reagent, so it will oxidize the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid. And this generates a monocarboxylic acid. And if you heat these things, they can undergo dehydration and they'll form an internal ester or a lactone in this case. And this reaction works well and you get about an 83% yield. And this is the product of that material. Now oxidation, um, this is just basically what I said, that the oxidation yields an acid which can subsequently um, react to form a lactone. More vigorous oxidative conditions, in this case nitric acid, can lead to the formation of the dicarboxylic acid. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to react these materials into, first of all, things that they can isolate. Carboxylic acids, as you know, are solids, so they can isolate those a little bit more easily than sugars. Sugars are notoriously difficult to crystallize, and sugars are also a very, very... Um, unstable species, okay? So if you stick a piece of bread in a toaster and you turn on the toaster, what happens? Well, it goes brown. Well, what's happening in that? Well, if you think about what starch is, which is just basically glucose molecules connected through an alpha um, connection, um, why is it turning brown? And what's happening in those reactions is you're actually um, dehydrating the glucose molecule and water is being forced off. And this is what causes the brown color. So we're degrading an organic molecule in this case. But at any rate, they're very difficult to work with. And so by making these acids, we can um, isolate them and identify them more easily. So treatment with nitric acid at 60 degrees creates this dicarboxylic acid which is demaneric acid. And as a group, these are all called aldaric acids. 
um, oxidative cleavage of sugars. Okay, so here, oxidative cleavage with periotic acid. What happens is vicinal dialcohols react with periotic acid, and it cleaves the carbon-carbon bond to create two aldehydes. Okay, now this reaction is illustrated here with this uh, vicinal dialcohol, this cyclic one. We actually can cleave and open this ring to create a dialdehyde. And I've drawn it kind of weird here and made one long bond. I just wanted you to see the original six membered um, ring that was there. This works very well, 77% yield. Now, because sugars have many vicinal diols, oxidation can lead to complex mixtures, but we, we learned over the years how to identify the components of these mixtures, and this can tell us how long our carbon chain is. So for the following aldose, if you treat this with per periotic acid, what you're going to get is you're going to get five equivalents of formic acid, and these are going to be C1 through C5. You're going to get one equivalent of formaldehyde, which is C6 on the end. Now, if you have a ketose and you treat it with periotic acid, you're going to get three equivalents of formic acid, which are C3 through 5 two equivalents of formaldehyde, which are C1 and C6, and C2 is going to generate carbon dioxide. So we can tell by the outcomes of these reactions whether they were ketose or an aldose, and also um, how many carbons are in the structure itself. The mechanism is shown down here. It's not really a critical mechanism, but you just create this um, cyclic esters type species, which undergoes oxidative cleavage through the movement of the electrons, as you see there. Okay, now um, moving on to the last page, reduction of monosaccharides, aldotols. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our polysaccharide, or we're gonna take our monosaccharide, um, an aldose, we're gonna treat it with sodium borohydride. That will, of course, reduce the um, carbonyl group to an alcohol. This creates an all alcohol species. This is referred to D-glucotol. This was glucose. Um, and this is also D-sorbitol, okay? This is actually found in nature in berries, cherries, plums, pears, and, a and apples. Um, but it is really just a reduction of glucose itself. Uh, carbonyl condensation with amine derivatives. Now, this is a reaction that you would have been doing in lab if you had been able to carry on in the lab. Um, this is phenylhydrazone and phenylozazone formation. Now, these reactions became critical in the identification of different sugars because, as I said already, it's difficult, difficult to crystallize sugars. So the ozazones give very nice yellow crystals, and this was really important in the original identification of which sugars are which. So what happens is here with this aldose, D-mannose, you treat it with phenylhydrazine, um, in ethanol, you heat for 30 minutes and you create this D mannose phenylhydrazone. If you treat this um, again with phenylhydrazine, um, you can oxidize the alpha position and create this di um, phenyl ozazone species, which will be crystalline and easy to isolate and purify. That's the end of all the material today. Everybody have a great day. Take care.